Now, I don't know about you, when you look out on uh, the media or when you're perhaps on Facebook, there are so many rags to riches stories out there because I think they make good reading or when they're a film, they make good viewing. One of my favorite films that always sticks in my mind is The Pursuit of Happiness from 2006, where, which features Will Smith and his son based on a true story of uh, Chris Gardner, who became homeless for a year. And one of the things that goes through that film, there are many, many poignant moments, but there's something that sticks in my mind that thinks, don't give up. Chris Gardner never gave up, even down to the last five bucks in his wallet when he got that cab fare. And at the very end of the film, spoiler alert, at the very end of the film, you see a wonderful moment when he's there before the partners, and he says that he's dressed nicely that day to meet the partners, and they say, they say to him, well, why don't you put a shirt on again tomorrow? Because he has won that full-time position. It's a rag to riches stories. And I think it speaks to the human psyche because perhaps there's something in it. What would it mean to me if I was to lose everything? If I was to lose my job, my house, my finances, how would we go on? The Pursuit of Happiness is something that I think is a very good and positive film. Compare that with today where you can go on the internet and you get bombarded with adverts that say something like, spend £30 on this course, spend 10 hours learning and create a passive income of £2,000 a month for life. You can retire early, work 10 hours a week and all will be wonderful. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? Usually because it is. Now, both of those examples show us that society, I mean, we already know this, values wealth. It values what the, the idea that money will bring us happiness. It values the idea that when you become rich, you'll have everything sorted and life will be wonderful and everything in the garden will be rosy. And I think in many ways, perhaps, that's one reason why people play the National Lottery. It's the allure of becoming rich and having money because they think it will bring about happiness. But as we all know so well, money does not bring everything that we need. Indeed, there are so many stories of National Lottery winners who are, who are penniless, who are fed up, who are depressed, who are lonely because they know that it doesn't bring the happiness that they want. Yes, it might bring instant gratification in that moment when you spend, some, spend money on something new. Says he who bought a new Lego set this week, Notre Dame Cathedral, by the way, really, really exciting. Sorry, love. But, it, but that feeling of instant gratification never lasts. It's a temporary thing. These few short verses at the end of James chapter 4 in some ways speak into this. And it shows us that the pursuit of wealth is not actually a modern day phenomenon. Because as we read in these verses, there are the Christians that are there that are going about to different places because they think it will bring them more money. Last week, as Helen referred to, we explored the dangers of not submitting ourselves to God and allowing our own personal and selfish ambitions to take priority. In verses 11 to 12, which I didn't touch on last week, but were at the end of the reading, James looks at this again and warns against the temptation to put ourselves in the place of God. The passage we have today then highlights the danger in relation to our future plans. So once again, surprise, surprise, we should know this by now, James is going to use some stern words to warn us about the future. In the time when James wrote this letter, he's telling the story about a Christian, who, as I say, who's running a small business, and they think, well, let's move somewhere else, we'll make more money, and then maybe move on and make even more money. Their idea is their pursuit of wealth. They may even be suggesting, this is potentially controversial, that because God is on their side, they can plan more securely because when they go, God has already gone with them, so they'll get even more. Whatever the case in that point, though, James reminds us what our life is actually like. Friends, quite simply, we have no idea what today will bring. We have no idea what tomorrow will bring. Now, sure, when I woke up this morning, 
and came to church. I have an idea of what might happen. I'd seen Helen's service plan. I put it onto the system. That all should be working. I've got my notes prepared. I have an idea of what might happen. But what if God intervenes? And God will intervene because he is a God that does intervene. The ideas that I had in my head may not actually play out in reality. And so sometimes that's for the better. You know, all the preparation in the world might be meaningless if something happens that we weren't expecting. So are we going to allow God to interrupt us? Are we going to allow God to intervene in the plans that we have? And are we going to humble ourselves before him once again? We're back to chapter, the earlier part of chapter 4. We need to act with humility. The lesson once again is to be humble before God. If we look back to last week, verse 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. We have to get into a mindset of being in a place whereby we take each day as a gift from God. And then we plan each day in that light. We then, in many ways, get a more stern warning than we've had before. Because James says, not doing what we know we should do is actually to sin. It isn't enough to avoid the obvious acts of sin. And this is where we start to see some of the theology come out about sins of commission, the things that we do that we shouldn't do, and the sins of omission, those things that we should do that we don't do. And actually, I think in many ways, the Book of Common Prayer, in its, in its confession prayer, is very good in this. Forgive us for the things that we ought to have done and the things that we ought not to have done. It's much more deliberate in tell, saying to us, there are sins of commission and omission. But when we're humble enough, to accept God's royal law and live by it. We can learn to accept God's sovereign ordering of life and learn to live our lives within that. And when we're able to do that, we'll start to see more positive things to which we are being called. Now, this could be a major life change. Perhaps it's questioning your vocation. Perhaps it's looking at changing career. Perhaps it's thinking about moving house. Or it could be that small nudge of the spirit to do something kind for your neighbor or say hello to the random person that you pass in the street. But when we get that nudge, whether for the big or the small, if we are then to ignore it or pretend we haven't heard it, then James is telling us that we are setting ourselves up in the place of God and we're allowing our own pride to get in the way because we're not willing to surrender our thoughts and our feelings and our actions to God. So, we've been through four chapters of James so far. There's one chapter left. And yet the punches still keep coming, reminding us how to live our lives as a Christian. So if we're going to be humble before God, if we're going to submit ourselves to him in the way James is telling us, it adds a whole new dimension to living. Because it means that we have to act upon those things where we sense the Lord is saying to us or asking us to do. How good are we at that? Are we one of those people that think, yes, Lord, you're calling me. I'm going to go and do it now. Or are we like Jonah? Oh, that's great, Lord, but I'm going this way because I'm scared. That one's probably me, if I'm really honest. We tend to get scared and we back down when God is asking us to take a risk and step out. I'm reminded of John Wimber who used to say, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Are we willing to take that risk when God intervenes? Are we willing to take that risk when God interrupts the plans that we have for the day, the week, the month, our lives, and follow his call? Or are we simply going to go, well, actually, God, I know better than you. I've got this all sorted. I'm going this way. Do we know best? Do we leave God as an afterthought? Or are we going to submit ourselves wholly to him and take those risks when he asks us to take them, even if it's not something we are comfortable with. So I wonder, when was the last time you took a risk for God? 
Perhaps it's something very small. Maybe you've got a testimony of this week where you've taken a risk on a prompting of the Spirit. And you can say, actually, God was at work there. I took that risk. Perhaps it was a big risk. Perhaps it's, you know, you've got, I don't know, a promotion on the table. Do you take that promotion? Do you leave that job? Do you find somewhere else to live? When was the last time you took a risk? And I wonder, how did it work out for you? I'm going back a few years, but I'm sure I've shared this story before, but I'll share it again. When Amanda and I were getting married, we had our own ideas of what we wanted. We had the idea of who we wanted to conduct the service, where we wanted to get married, and the date we wanted to get married on. And we kept hitting brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. Then one day, when we were driving back to Bentham, where we lived at the time, I said to Amanda, we haven't prayed about this. So we went back to where I was living. We prayed. We surrendered all of our plans to him, and within 48 hours, we had a date, a venue, and a priest who was available. It was not what we had planned at all, but when the day came, it was far, far better than we could have ever imagined. Hopefully, Amanda will agree with me on that one. It was even down to the point that the hotel where we had the reception forgotten to do the top table display. So we used Amanda's bouquet, and actually when we saw them moving everything out the following morning to put the the next wedding in, we we looked at the bouquet and thought, I prefer what we did. So even the fact that the hotel forgot, it was better for what we wanted, because we were willing to take a risk and give it to God. It's easy, though, I know, for me to stand here and share that with you and say, look at this, it worked out so well. It's easy to reflect and see where God had had worked his purposes out. But what about the times when we take that risk for God, when we take that step and things don't work out the way we planned? Perhaps we've explored our vocation and it's not worked out the way we expected. Indeed, one of the candidates I was supporting through the discernment process, we were both sure it was right for her to go for ministry she got, went to the selection panel, and it came back with a, not yet. It was really hard. That sense of the church saying, not at the moment, is really, really difficult to hear. She'd taken a risk. It hadn't worked out as she expected. Perhaps we followed a prompting from the Spirit to talk to somebody in the street, and it didn't go as expected. That's okay, though. Because on a human level, it might look like it didn't do anything. It might look like a failure. It might feel like a failure. Yet, don't give up is the message. Because in God's kingdom, nothing is wasted. Indeed, the candidate I spoke about is now seeing somebody else. That's how the diocese works. You go to somebody else, if you get out, and she's going back to her stage two a couple of years later. And a hope that I think she will get through to, uh, to, to a train for ordination. But in the moment, sometimes it feels really hard and really, really difficult. And in those moments, think about, I think back to Chris Gardner in the pursuit of happiness. Don't give up because nothing is wasted in the kingdom of God. Perhaps that last verse of chapter 4 is one that sometimes produces a sense of anguish in our hearts. Can I be sure I've done what I should have done? How do I know? Well, Tom Wright tells us that if we're worried about that, then we're probably doing okay. So that's a relief. If we worry obsessively, though, that takes us away from God. So what James is essentially getting to is that we are foolish if we rely on anything other than God. That's the end of it, really. That's the summary. We're foolish if we rely on anything other than God. I could sit down and give up. You probably will be happy at that. We might have money in the bank. We might, be in, we might have some investments. They could go in the click of a finger. We might have. We might rely on our job, our profession. That could go in the click of a finger. We value peace in the world. Well, at the moment, while the world is on the brink of war, that could go in the click of a finger. Not to a scaremonger or anything. But if we're relying on those things other than God then we're lacking integrity as disciples of Jesus Christ. After all, the world as it currently is lacks integrity. People lie and deceive to make others believe them. Think back to the American election in 2020. 
when Trump refused to accept that he had been defeated at the polls. I wonder what's going to happen in just a few weeks' time. Will we see the same thing? Will we see that lack of integrity from our world leaders? For ourselves, how much integrity do we have? Within the church, I think we're very quick to compliment someone to their face, but how quick are we at then going behind their back and talking to somebody else? How good are we when somebody says, I want to share something with you, but I want you to keep it confidential, to then go and find somebody else and go, guess what, I know this about so-and-so. The church is not good at showing integrity, and I think it's something we have to get right in our walk with Jesus. When we think of the life of the church, perhaps if the church and the people in the church were to show integrity in their discipleship, in their walk with Jesus, then we would start to see a difference. Again, I've shared this before. One of my best friends said to me, I'm never going to go to church while you're all arguing with each other. And I just had to look at him and say, well, I'm sorry, mate. You're never going to come to church then. We're not very good at acting with integrity. Perhaps it's a lesson for us. Perhaps it's a lesson for us, a wake-up call, that we need to learn to rely on God for everything. And as the proverb says, not lean on our own understanding. As I was preparing for this talk, I came across someone called Arthur F. Holmes, who wrote a book called Shaping Character. Now, this is back from 1990, and it was all about moral education in the Christian college. And he outlines what happens when we order our hearts and minds within us to the Lord, alertness to the Spirit and the teaching of the Scripture. There are 11 steps, and don't worry, I'm not going to go through them all in great detail. I'm going to quickly race through those steps. First of all, he says we need to be, raise our consciousness to become aware of the wider world outside of ourselves. We need to be more aware of what's going on out there than being too focused on what's going on in here. We need to sensitize our consciousness to feel compassion for those out there that are caught in the web of evil and deceit and that lack integrity. We need to understand the values that nations, companies, and other people have, which shapes their practice, shape, blah, which in practice shapes their behavior. We need to become aware of the values that we as individuals and organizations functionally embrace. We need to think in universal terms to construct a moral framework based on biblical principles. And that's how we live out our lives. We explore the elements of morally complex situations. For example, he says, the Bible tells us not to lie, but was it right for those people who were hiding Jews in World War II to lie to the Gestapo to say that they, were Jew, that they didn't know where the Jews were? Interesting example. We need to have the courage to act on those previous things that I've just shared. We need to make moral decisions on a consistent basis, this, which helps to seal the principles of Scripture on our heart. We need to develop godly character, not just right behaviors. And we need to become a unified person, which James 1.4 calls mature and complete. That's a big ask. And I know I've raced through that, and you're probably not going to remember any of that. It's a big ask. But James is calling us to maturity as disciples, to complete and integral people who are people of faith. Are we willing to take that step? Are we willing to become a person of integrity? To become a person who is willing to take those risks for God when he calls? To not plan our lives around what we think is right for us, but to plan in what God has in store for us. We face many ethical decisions, and they're often going to be based on a set of rules that we find near at hand. Let's make sure that the rules that we base our decisions on are in this book, the Word of God, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever, because it talks about the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we are not getting our morals right by this book, we're doing something wrong. If we are doing things that go against this Word, we are not people of integrity. We are not acting as we are called to do. So are you willing to take that step, to learn to live in complete and utter dependence on God? Is the church willing to do that and take that step? 
I think we have to relearn as a church what dependence on God means. Because for too long, the church has gone its own way, thinking it knows best, and that's led us to all sorts of issues and problems. And I'm not talking about this church specifically. I'm talking about the worldwide church. Let's hold on to dependence on God. Let's learn to follow his lead and trust his calling. Then we can say with conviction what James says in verse 15. If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. After all, Jesus made decisions on the basis of principles rooted in Scripture and a sensitivity to the will of God. James wants the same for us. He wants us to make decisions that are integrated across our hearts and our minds because that is Christian character. Based on God, living a life that God has called us. So what can we take from today? Not to judge one another, but to trust God in all that we do, think, and say. Because if we trust in God fully and learn to be fully dependent on him, that is what's going to make a difference to the world. That is what is going to make a difference to the church. And that is what is going to make a difference to ourselves. So how's your heart today? Where is your mind? Is it set on the things of God? Or is it set on the personal and selfish ambitions we looked at last week? Let me ask you this. Are you willing to live a life of integrity as a disciple of Jesus Christ, learning to trust in God for everything? Amen.